as John mentioned, I'm going to talk to you guys about the specularity, but I'm actually going to start by quoting from the Bible, and I'm going to try to do it from memory, so hopefully no one uh, is too offended if I get it wrong. Uh, the people had one language and one voice, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city uh, with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may not be scattered across the world. And when the Lord saw this, he came down and he said, if the people with one voice can do this, then there is nothing they can do, they cannot do. Uh, and he said, let us uh, confuse them and scatter them. And so you guys probably recognize the story. It's the story of the Tower of Babel, one of the more famous stories of the Bible, and kind of a weird story when I first heard about it. Uh, you know, God maybe doesn't come off in the best of lights, uh, but that's probably a subject for a talk about philosophy, not a talk about AI. Uh, from my perspective, it made me think that, you know, understanding each other, understanding the human voice, it's really the original superpower, uh, if it's one that even God was afraid of. Uh, and it's a particularly personal superpower to me. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I came to the U.S. at age 13, uh, maybe not quite this long ago, uh, but it made me realize what it's like not to have the superpower. And this is even though I took English classes before I came, it was still quite challenging uh, to understand people and make myself understood. Uh, That's probably what led me, like many of you here, to uh, study computers, to program, because programming, much more unambiguous, is either you get it right or you get it wrong. If you get it wrong, well, you move on to debugging, and hopefully you uh, are able to get it right, <laughs> and uh, you, know, you move on. Uh, but despite having this amazing ability to communicate with computers unambiguously, we've always wanted to make computers understand us in our natural voice, in our human voice, uh, pretty much from the beginning of having computers. Uh, the first system that could properly be called speech recognition was called Audrey. I think it stood for automatic digital, digit recognition uh, in 1952 from Bell Labs. And it could understand nine digits with 90% accuracy. And by uh, 1960, Three, I think, uh, we had IBM Shoebox, and it was up to 16 words. So it wasn't exactly the rapid progress we've kind of come to expect from AI these days. Uh, but we kept going, and uh, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, we had a breakthrough uh, with a statistical method of doing speech recognition, kind of modeled speech recognition as a set of states at the word level, phrase level, sentence level, and uh, the transitions between those states were labeled with probabilities. And the problem is basically one of finding the best path uh, through this. That's what speech recognition became. And this is what enabled us actually to move speech track from kind of a toy to something that could actually, uh, something that could actually be useful. Um, this kind of took us through the 2010s with increasing amounts of data. Then we hit another uh, plateau. And to break through that plateau, we needed uh, deep neural nets, neural nets that uh, model the structure of our brains, right? Like uh, uh, layers of uh, uh, cells that you know, have a computation, and when they either fire or they don't, they activate other, um, other cells. And um, this is like really what brought us to this point today, where it's P-Track is on the verge of, I think, a, 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 a shift of being almost good enough to actually being good enough. And I've seen this like firsthand, you know, work at Rev. We've been doing speech rec since 2015. We started with a hybrid model, uh, partially neural net, partially statistical. And just this last year, we've moved on to an end-to-end -end, uh, system, which we've seen an amazing shift in accuracy. And I think it's actually getting us closer to what, uh, what I call, it, well, uh, the specularity. Specularity is actually a term uh, coined by uh, Matt Thompson, uh, who's a journalist in 2010, uh, and he defined it as the moment when speech recognition becomes free, fast, and decent. Uh, and I think we're pretty much there with fast. We're not there with free, but I think it's cheap enough where it's close enough. Uh, what's more important is the decent part, because there's really a point where uh, before there was too many mistakes and you couldn't rely on the output of the speech track system. And then there's a moment where you can, and that opens up a whole new range of use cases. Uh, and to me, it's a little bit like you know, another uh, problem in AI that's been you know, uh, our goal for a long time, driving automation. People have probably seen this uh, 
these levels of driving automation, you know, where on the left, uh, level zero through two, it's still kind of you, uh, an aid, and on the right, it's true automation. And when you confuse, you know, things on uh, levels on the left with levels on the right, then you get kind of stories like uh, the other day I read that someone tried to uh, use Smart Summit on a Tesla, uh, and it crashed into a two, three and a half million dollar private jet. Uh, and so it's kind of pretty not so good if you if you don't realize what level you're in. Um, and uh, I think similarly about like speech recognition competency levels. You know, I still remember like when I first experienced level one, and I could kind of speak out my social security number into a phone prompt instead of having to type it in. That was kind of cool. Uh, today we're probably uh, at level two, right? We all use Siri and Alexa, and they're pretty cool. Uh, but they all uh, they do make quite a bit of mistakes. Although usually those mistakes are not quite as expensive as the mistakes made by driving systems. Um, but it's really somewhere around between level three and level four that uh, the specularity arrives. Uh, and that's, I think, where we're almost there today. Uh, oops. Uh, skip ahead. Uh, so uh, what will happen uh, when the specularity arrives? Well, it's going to be pretty amazing in many ways. First of all, of course, accessibility for people who are hard of hearing suddenly gaining access to a whole new set of uh, information that they only either had limited access to or could only get the ones where uh, there was a human transcriptionist who could transcribe it for them. That's going to be life-changing for them. And for the rest of us, uh, you know, imagine being able to uh, search audio as easily as you search Slack or email today. Imagine being able to find something that your doctor said to you in a visit a year ago. Or imagine being able to uh, really find what was said at that city hall meeting or at that, uh, on that police cam video that you saw in the news. It's going to be pretty groundbreaking. But uh, it's not all good news. Uh, today already, we live in a world of information abundance, not information scarcity, kind of like where we were uh, in the 1950s, where those first speech recognition systems were created. So our challenge is going to become one from getting the information to being able to process the information, and sift the signal from the noise. And this, in a sense, is a much more difficult problem uh, because it's much more personal. What signal to one person is quite different uh, than what signal is to another person. Almost kind of the same difference as between computer language and human language. So that's going to be the next challenge, and it's a challenge we're going to have to solve. But I think it's going to be a really exciting and important uh, challenge to solve. Uh, and that kind of brings me to this uh, slide. Uh, I was kind of thinking, uh, how should we like, think about AI? And I was reminded of this uh, game. It's maybe a little bit of an inappropriate game in 2022, Kiss, Marry, Kill. But I kind of decided maybe it's still OK to talk about it. Uh, I Googled it, actually, and I saw some mentions of it as recently as 2020. So I decided, OK, it's still, still OK today. And so how should we think about it? Uh, kiss, marry or kill? Well, at first, I think our initial reaction is kiss. It's exciting, as we just uh, discussed. So many new possibilities. Kind of like when we meet those robots in Ex Machina, we're drawn to them, uh, we're intrigued. But then we watch the rest of the movie, and uh, we realize things sometimes don't turn out so well, actually. So maybe like our next reaction is like, no, let's kill it. And that's maybe an understandable uh, impulse, but it's kind of too late. Like, AI is here, it's too useful, it's too important. We're not going to actually kill it. So that actually leaves us with our third choice, and it's actually the best choice of all, right? It's to marry. It's to embrace AI and uh, make us and AI together greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, and, you know, like any good marriage, it will require a lot of work. Uh, but uh, it's work that we have to do. And personally, I've been married for almost 15 years. It's been a very happy marriage for me. I think we're going to be married to AI for a lot longer than 15 years. So we might as well make that a happy marriage as well. Thank you.